Good morning. So here's a spectacular view of the sunrise from the top of Arunachala Mountain. Oh, wait a minute. That's just a photo on my iPad. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Another minute. It's, it's just a reflection in this mirror on my, on my messy old cluttered desk. So, what's real? Namaste. So what was that all about? Well, if you remember from the last episode, the last quote concludes, thus he regards it as empty of whatever is not there. Whatever remains he discerns as present. There is this. And so this his entry into emptiness accords with actuality, is undistorted in meaning, and pure. So, our problem is, we're not seeing what is there. Instead, we're seeing something that's not there. What do I mean by that? Well, in the apparent view of Arunachala from the top, you see the shadow of the mountain going off into the distance. So you're not seeing the mountain. You're seeing the shadow of the mountain. You see? But I bet everybody in their minds thought of Arunachala and saw Arunachala, the mountain. And then the camera zooms out a little bit and you see, oh, actually, <laughs> it's just a picture on an iPad. See, the apparent perception of the mountain is the conclusions that we draw, the models that we make in our mind, which aren't really there. They're just thoughts. And the picture on the iPad represents the inputs of the senses, which again are just thoughts. Well, you can call them perceptions, but what is a perception? <laughs> it's just a thought about what is there. And a thought isn't a thing. And then the camera pulls out even more and you see that the whole thing is a reflection in a mirror. And the mirror represents awareness. So if the picture on the iPad represents consciousness and perception and the subject-object duality, the mirror represents the singleness of perception. And the fact that whatever you put in front of a mirror, the mirror adopts its quality. So we think life is all about the contents of awareness, which in most cases is consciousness and its objects. In other words, sense perception. But if we zoom out a little bit more, we see that, no, actually the reality is we're looking in a mirror called awareness. And awareness is so big that the whole universe shows up in it. God and everybody. 
So how big is awareness? How big of a space are we? See? And the, the trick that I'm trying to teach you <laughs> is not to be aware or not to focus on the contents of awareness, but to focus on awareness itself. So, in other words, it's like the mirror reflecting itself. A mirror can't do that, but awareness can. Because awareness is the void. Awareness is emptiness. Awareness is what always is there, what never changes, what is unborn and therefore deathless. Awareness is you, yourself. Yeah, your self is an emptiness. And that's why most people are never aware of their self. They never take their self into account, but they remain fixated on the contents of awareness, which is consciousness and its objects, the senses and their perceptions. So remember, the Buddha's teaching is apophatic. He doesn't talk about what's there. He talks about what's not there. So because of our conditioning, we have a hard time computing this. We are so trained up, so conditioned by positivism. We have a hard time keeping in mind what's not there. And we only see what we think is there in our little model of reality. But as we saw, just zooming out a little bit can change that whole model profoundly. So with that, <laughs> I want to continue reading in the Chula Sunyata Sutta. And the next section is about the perception of earth. Further, Ananda, the monk, not attending to the perception of human being, not attending to the perception of wilderness, attends to the singleness based on the perception of earth. His mind takes pleasure, finds satisfaction, settles and indulges in its perception of earth. Just as a bull's hide is stretched free from wrinkles with a hundred stakes, even so, without attending to all the ridges and hollows, the river ravines, the tracts of stumps and thorns, the craggy irregularities of this earth, he attends to the singleness based on the perception of earth. His mind takes pleasure, finds satisfaction, settles, and indulges in its perception of earth. He discerns that whatever disturbances that would exist based on the perception of human being are not present. Whatever disturbances that would exist based on the perception of wilderness are not present. There is only this modicum of disturbance, the singleness based on the perception of earth. He discerns that this mode of perception is empty of the perception of a human being. This mode of perception is empty of the perception of wilderness. There is only this non-emptiness, the singleness based on the perception of earth. Thus, he regards it as empty of whatever is not there. Whatever remains, he discerns as present. There is this. And so this, his entry into emptiness, accords with actuality, is undistorted in meaning, and pure. This is beautiful, huh? He is not seeing the earth with, what does he say, all its craggy irregularities. He is seeing the element earth 
or rather the state of matter, earth. And because he's concentrating on that, all these other perceptions, perceptions of being a human being, perceptions of the wilderness, all the different details are not there. And he perceives their lack as emptiness. So that's how we have to train ourselves to see not only what is there, but what is not there. When we concentrate on our senses, what is not there is awareness. So our awareness falls into the black hole of emptiness and we miss it. To contrast this, let's look at another quote from another sutta, the famous Mulapariyaya Sutta. There is the case, monks, where an uninstructed run-of-the-mill person who has no regard for noble ones, who is not well-versed or disciplined in their dhamma, who has no regard for men of integrity, is not well-versed or disciplined in their dhamma, perceives earth as earth. Perceiving earth as earth, he conceives things about earth. He conceives things in earth. He conceives things coming out of earth. He conceives earth as mine. He delights in earth. Why is that? Because he has not comprehended it, I tell you. You see the difference? The ordinary uninstructed man, which is in Buddha's language is called Putujana, does not see what is not there. He only sees what is present. And then he projects all this ego stuff. He conceives of earth. He has an idea about earth. He has a model of earth. What is earth for him? Oh, maybe it's a piece of land. Huh? If he's a farmer, he thinks, oh, this is a piece of land I can farm. If he's a construction guy, he thinks, oh, this is a piece of land I can build on. If he's a, uh, a financial wizard, he thinks this is a piece of land I could buy and make a profit on reselling. A real estate speculator. If he's a conservationist, he thinks this is a piece of land I can use to protect endangered species and so on and so on and so forth. According to his background, his intention, who he thinks he is. And then he starts to project things on it. Oh, I can build this. I can do that. I can, you know, turn this into a profit this way or that way or the other way. I can bring people out here and give tours, <laughs> you know, whatever. So then he conceives things coming from the earth. I can get this from that earth. I can get that from it. I can make a profit. And then he conceives earth as mine. Why? Because his bias is he wants to justify the story that I exist. And so to prove the existence of this non-existent <laughs> entity called I, which is only a thought, he projects the idea of mine into everything that he perceives. This is nuts. <laughs> this is a mental disease. <laughs> and we all have it. It's called ego. The only one who can help us with it is ourselves. We have to do the work to pierce through this self-created illusion and see the reality. Compare this with the monk that the Buddha talks about, who he says, 
Whatever disturbances that would exist based on the perception of human being are not present or would exist based on the perception of wilderness are not present. This is not present. That is not present. He sees so many things as absent. He sees the emptiness. That's the difference between a well-trained monk, a meditator, and an ordinary person. The meditator is aware of the negative spaces, of the emptiness. And finally, he perceives his own self in terms of the ego being absent. Thus, he regards it as empty of whatever is not there. So you see, this is the value of emptiness. It makes us sane. It helps us stop this disease of ego projection, where we conceive all kinds of imaginary things and project them on what's really there. The monk sees whatever is absent as absent. He sees whatever is present as present. He doesn't try to project anything or overlay anything. Huh? Like, what's that called? Assisted reality or enhanced reality or whatever. He only sees what's there. He doesn't make up any stories about it. He doesn't try to claim it as mine. You see, this is the root of all the troubles, all the suffering in the world and all the problems in life. And if you can stop this one bad habit, you will improve your mental health, your quality of life, your quality of consciousness, and your intelligence far beyond the ordinary, unschooled human being. And you will come that much closer to the ultimate reality of Nibbana. Aum Tat Sat. Buddha Sarai.